Uh, welcome to the fourth webinar organized by Computational Social Science Laboratory of the Chinese University of uh, Hong Kong. I'm Bo Huang, a co-director of the laboratory. I'm very pleased to chair this uh, uh, webinar. And today, we have distinct pleasure to have Professor Sulian Xiao uh, here to give a webinar on space, time, and human dynamics. Uh, let me introduce him uh, briefly. Uh, Dr. Sulen Xiao is a chancellor's professor, which is the high, highest honor for professors at his university, and Elwin and Sally Beeman Professor of Geography at the University of Tennessee, uh, Knoxville. His research interests cover transportation, time geography, space-time GIS, and human dynamics. He is actually one of the pioneers in the area of GIS for transportation. He co-authored the book, Geographic Information Systems for Transportation Principles and Applications, together with Professor uh, Harvey Miller. So actually, before I taught the GIS for Transportation course for the Master GIS program here, he taught it, and I learned a lot from his uh, materials. He is the lead editor of Springer's Human Dynamics in Smart Cities book series and an editorial board member of several academic journals, including International Journal of Geographic Information Science, Journal of Transport Geography, and the Travel Behavior and Society. He received the Edward L. Alman Award for Outstanding Contributions to the Field of Transportation Geography and the Outstanding Scholar Award in Regional Development and Planning from the Association of American Geographers. He is an elected fellow of the American Association for Advancement of Science, AAAS, and the president-elect of the University Consortium for Geographic Information uh, Science, UCGIS. So he will be the president uh, from next uh, year. Okay, without further ado, uh, Professor Shaw, please. Okay, thank you very much, Professor Huang, for this nice introduction and uh, giving me this opportunity of sharing some of my thoughts on space, time, and human dynamics in GI science with the group of people today online. So uh, COVID-19 has changed a lot of things, including human dynamics and uh, this Zoom meeting. So I hope this is a timely topic for us to discuss how we can better handle human dynamics in GI science. So to start with my presentation, I would like to, hmm, okay. I would like to start with this question. So we all know that humans are key elements in social science research, but how have we handled humans? in geographic information systems and the GI science. This is one example of when social sciences meet with computational science. So I know many of you have been working with GI science for quite a long time. And uh, so if we really think about it, how have we handled humans in GIS and the GI science? Probably not very well. So, uh, I will start with some background information. Max Engelhofer and David Mark back in 1995, more than 25 years ago, suggested that naive geography captures and reflects the way people think and the reason about geographic space and time. They also argue that naive geography is the basis for the design of intelligent GIS that will act and respond as a person would. This was stated more than 25 years ago, but unfortunately, if we think about GIS today, we are still far away from acting and responding as humans would. So before I continue, may I know if you can all hear me well? Yes. Okay, good, yes. thank you. So, uh, if we look at the conventional GIs we have been using for several decades now, 
conventional GIS very much follow the traditional cartographic approach. We represent locations in physical space, a static map layers like the diagram on the right. Okay. And uh, this approach is very much based on the Newton's concept of absolute space. And uh, we have been using Euclidean geometry and the Cartesian coordinate system to implement conventional GIS so far. I would argue that this particular conceptualization of space as Newton's concept of absolute space has major limitations if we want to handle humans in GIS, okay? So let me try to give a brief uh, introduction about what is human dynamics. So if we try to come up with a universal definition of human dynamics, it can be very hard because there are many different disciplines and uh, approaches involved in human dynamics research. And also the concepts, methods, and the applications of human dynamics research are likely to evolve with the changing environments, technologies, and human societies. So for example, climate change is changing the way we approach human dynamics. Pandemics like the COVID-19 has significantly changed human dynamics and how we approach human dynamics. So instead of defining the boundary of this evolving field of human dynamics research, it may be more productive. We simply outline some major concepts. So one thing about human beings is that we need to fulfill different kinds of needs in our daily lives, okay? These needs include physiological needs, we need to eat, okay? Economic needs, we need to work. Social needs, we need to have friends, okay? And talk to them. Psychological needs, we need to feel safe, etc. cetera. So on the right-hand side, there's an example of Maslow's hierarchy of needs to reflect different levels of human needs that we need to fulfill in our life. And the human dynamics, in my definition, covers all kinds of human activities and the interactions. And the, these human dynamics are critical to fulfill the different human needs we need and the, in a space and the time context, okay? So today, we all live in this so-called smart, connected, mobile, and dynamic world. It is important to keep in mind that humans, they are not just points, okay, on a map. They are actually dynamic and the living entities. We constantly move around between different locations over time to carry out different activities and the interactions in order to meet our different needs, okay? And uh, especially in recent years, the modern information and the communication technologies, the so-called ICTs, such as the internet, mobile devices, have significantly changed human dynamics in both physical space and virtual space. So in physical space, we use transportation to move between different locations. And in virtual space now, we use ICT to navigate between different virtual places. For example, from Facebook, page to Twitter to a Zoom meeting, okay? And uh, it is important to keep in mind that what we do in physical space are not independent from what we do in virtual space. In fact, these human activities and the interactions in physical space and virtual space, they influence and they interact with each other. So this hybrid physical virtual world certainly brings up new challenges, okay? To many researchers, including people in GI science. For example, if we ask, what is the location of Google or Amazon or Twitter that we should represent in GIS? What would be your answer? And the one downside of using Room is that I cannot see all the audience 
at the same time. So that uh, you know, reduces the opportunities for real-time interactions. So essentially, you know, the location of Google could be represented in GIS, for example, by the coordinates of its headquarters in Mountain View, California, using the concept of absolute space. That's what we have been doing in conventional GIS. But the location of Google also could be represented by the URLs of Google websites, which will be different in different countries. Like in Hong Kong, I believe it's google.com.hk. Okay, in the US, it would be just google.com. And uh, also, it could be represented by the IP addresses of different Google servers around the world. Or it could be simply represented by its identity as Google. So then what is the location of Google? Okay, when we need to deal with it in GIS, in this hybrid physical virtual world. This brings up a very interesting question when we need to handle uh, human dynamics, okay? So my next question is, is the conventional absolute space approach we have been using in conventional GI science sufficient to support human dynamics research in geography, in social sciences, and in the humanities, especially in today's increasingly hybrid physical virtual world, okay? So you probably have guessed that what my answer is, but I will continue. Okay, so in order to tackle this issue, some researchers, including myself and the several uh, faculty members at Chinese University of Hong Kong, have been using the concepts of time geography to build the so-called space-time GIs to handle human dynamics. And uh, for those of you who may not be familiar with time geography, it was developed by a Swedish geographer, Torsten Hedstrom, back in the 1950s and the 1960s. And uh, he published a seminar paper that is frequently cited about time geography. And the time geography provides a very useful framework for studying individual activities in a space-time context. And uh, it covers many different concepts. One of the most frequently used concepts is the space-time pace shown on this slide. So in this case, we can keep track of the trajectory of any moving objects, whether a person, an animal, or other moving objects across space, x, y coordinates, and over time, the vertical dimension here, okay? So, uh, about, you know, uh, in late 2000, so, uh, about 15 years ago, or close to 20 years ago, we developed a temporal dynamic segmentation method uh, to try to integrate human activities and the interactions in both physical space and virtual space, okay, using GIS. So in this case, for example, a person, okay, uh, drove from home to the workplace in the morning, and had a room meeting with colleagues at other locations. Then at lunchtime, walked to a nearby restaurant and after lunch, returned back to workplace. After work, on the way home, received a phone call, mobile phone call from friends say, hey, let's get together. So they went to a bar and have some drinks, finally returned back home. So this allows us to integrate human activities and the interactions in both physical space and virtual space uh, within a GIS environment. And uh, we developed a time geography extension on top of ArcGIS uh, more than 15 years ago and made it uh, available online for a few years, but then we stopped uh, supporting uh, this uh, extension because uh, when, whenever ArcGIS <laughs> is upgraded, sometimes we also need to make some changes. Uh, so in this case, the, all the map layers can move along the time dimension and change over time. I just want to give one example here. So this was a collaborative research with uh, people at Peking University back in early uh, 
2010. So this paper was published in 2011. So uh, people at Peking University, they collected individual activity diaries of residents in 10 different neighborhoods in Beijing. And uh, here I'm showing uh, the data for two particular neighborhoods, San Lihe on the left-hand side and uh, Huilongguan on the right-hand side. And uh, each line here represents the space-time pass of one resident. Uh, they collected the data, activity diaries, and different colors on uh, the space-time pass. They reflect different types of activities. For example, red segments showing they were either at school or at work, and uh, purple showing they were either in sleep or having meals and the green reflects th their personal leisure time, okay? And uh, at least back then, most of these residents in San Lihe, they were government employees. And the residents in Huilongguan, they were middle and low income people. So by looking at individual space time pairs, we can see they had very different spatial temporal activity patterns between these two neighborhoods. Government employees, they had more regular activity patterns in a day than the middle and low income people in Huilongguan neighborhood. And uh, we can also aggregate the data to look at the aggregate spatial temporal activity patterns for these two neighborhoods, like the two anima animations show on the bottom of the slide. So we can see that for most residents inside Lihe, government employees, they returned back home in early evenings, okay? But the middle and low income people in Huilongguan, they, they still had to work all the way into late evening hours. So for example, in this case, we could reduce the public transit service for San Lihe by early evening without causing too much problems. But if we do it for the residents in Huilongguan, we can cause hardship to these middle and low income people. So, you know, this kind of thing certainly can be useful for many, many different social uh, science applications, okay? But is that enough to handle human dynamic in GI science? I would argue that's, you know, pretty useful, but probably still not sufficient. So then we developed and uh, proposed this human-centric space place, or for short, we call spatial GIS science framework for human dynamics research. And uh, we first published it in 2018 and then expanded uh, this framework and published in the annals of AAG last year. So instead of having locations as the center in conventional GIs, we put humans at the center of this new framework. And uh, we consider humans as dynamic and living objects. And uh, in order to support studies of human dynamics, the concept of absolute space that, have, that has been used in conventional GIS is good, but not enough. So we propose four different concepts of space, which are absolute space, relative space, relational space and mental space to support this GI science framework. In addition, we also incorporate four concepts of place, which are location, locale, place identity, and sense of place in this new framework, okay? And uh, we use a circle to connect these different concepts of space and place because Again, they are not independent from each other. They are all associated with each other. So let me uh, use the rest of the time to further explain this uh, space and the uh, place GI science framework with humans at the center. So absolute space, this is the foundation of conventional GIs that we know very well. And, uh, absolute space approach has served where well many different applications. So uh, we are not arguing we should stop 
the conventional GIS. In fact, the concept of absolute space will continue to be very useful for many applications. So we should continue the concept of absolute space and the conventional GIS. Okay, next, relative space. So for example, uh, indoor navigation has become popular. But if we look at indoor uh, navigation, how many of us actually use XYZ coordinates in absolute space to navigate inside the building? Probably not too many of us. Instead, the relative locations and the surrounding environments based on the concepts of locale, situation, and the context may be more intuitive and useful to human beings, okay? Other than indoor uh, navigation, uh, autonomous vehicles also have become a hot topic recently. So we know GIS has played a critical role in supporting autonomous vehicles for navigation. But if we ask this question, what is the positional accuracy of GIS databases? required to support operation of autonomous vehicles, okay? The current in vehicle navigation systems based on GPS, the accuracy level may be around 10 to 15 meters, but for autonomous vehicles, at least we need to be accurate to individual traffic lanes. That means positional accuracy to three to five centimeters. But if we are talking about parking, for example, in Hong Kong, then it will require positional accuracy of probably five to 10 centimeters, okay? So the question is, is it feasible to build a global GIS database accurate to five to 10 centimeters to support autonomous vehicles? Technically, the answer is yes, we could, but it can be very costly and time consuming. And even we can build a global GIS database at five to 10 centimeters accuracy level, how often can we update the database? Okay, probably not too often. But even we can update the database frequently, we should not forget out there, there are all kinds of vehicles, pedestrians, bicycles, motorcycles, and other objects moving around, keep changing locations. So if we rely on the concept of absolute space in conventional GIS to support autonomous vehicles, it's not going to work, okay? But we all know that all of the autonomous vehicles, they are mounted with all kinds of sensors, which can be very accurate, down to millimeter accuracy levels. So if we simply combine the concept of absolute space and the concept of relative space using the data from both sides, the problem can be solved easily, okay? We don't really need a global GIS database to a very high accuracy level that is very costly to build and hard to maintain, okay? So this is another example why relative space concept can be very useful for human dynamics research. And uh, this is important to many social science research. And uh, for COVID-19, we know contact tracing is an important tool to mitigate the spread of uh, COVID-19. Uh, in early days, we used GPS tracking for contact tracing. And uh, that brought up the privacy concerns. So Google and the Apple, they team together to develop an application based on Bluetooth technology. So the key difference between GPS and Bluetooth is Bluetooth is based on the concept of relative space. And uh, so that removes some concerns about privacy issues. So the concept of relative space can help address several different aspects in human dynamics research. Okay. And uh, we published an article about relative 
space-based GIS data model in SPIS Journal of Photogrammetry and uh, Remote Sensing a couple of years ago. Those of you who are interested in this approach, you are welcome to uh, access this paper. Okay. So next, relational space. Okay. Uh, under COVID-19, a lot of our activities are moving online, becoming more relational. So for example, online teaching and even Taylor Hairs is becoming more popular. In Hong Kong, the Hong Kong government has proposed Smart City Blueprint, now 2.0. And many of these initiatives in Hong Kong Smart City uh, Blueprint, they are actually based on the concepts of relational space, okay? So like social networks, all these Zoom meetings, okay? They are all examples of relational space. When we work with a relational space, the focus is on topological relations and the individual identity or place identity rather than absolute locations, okay? And uh, these kind of relations, they can exist in both physical space and virtual space, okay? Like social networks in physical space and online social networks, okay? And uh, again, you know, certainly it's possible to use time geography, space time GIS to incorporate some of these examples. This uh, was the article we published back in 2009. And uh, when you see, uh, based on the time geography extension uh, on top of ArcGIS. So when you see red lines, they represent space time pairs for individual people. And the gray lines, they are the space time pairs for physical entities like an office building, a restaurant, a library, etc. When you see breaks uh, on those physical, uh, on those uh, uh, great lines, uh, that means that particular entity is not available during those particular time windows. And the blue lines that reflect virtual entities such as Facebook, Amazon, Twitter, Zoom. So when, for example, when you see three red lines with one blue line, that could be an example of a room meeting among three pe different people using Zoom at that particular time point. So this allows us to integrate the human activities and the interactions in both physical space, absolute space, and relational space. And uh, in terms of mental space, so the focus now is on the mental and the cognitive aspects of humans, okay? And I did a search of Chinatown in New York City, okay? Using Google Maps just a few days ago, and uh, it returned the boundary of Chinatown in New York City. And at the same time, I also did the same search of Chinatown in New York City using OpenStreetMap. So we can see they return very different boundary lines. So which one is correct? Actually, we don't know because Chinatown does not have official boundary. So the boundary is perceived by different people in different ways, okay? So that's related to the mental space part. I did the same thing for Central in Hong Kong. Okay, using Google Maps and uh, uh, OpenStreetMap. Google Maps, again, returns the boundary. So those of you who are in Hong Kong, I don't know if you agree to the boundary or not, okay? But interestingly, uh, OpenStreetMap, in this case, did not return a boundary, okay? It only gives a reference point, okay? So this certainly reflects a lot of these challenges, okay? we have to deal with when we move into the mental space. And uh, also a few years ago, we also used Flickr photos, okay, to estimate how people perceive the boundary, the boundary lines of different types of places, okay? Again, you are welcome to access it if you are interested in this topic. And other uh, example about mental space I would like to share with you is back to autonomous vehicles. Okay, so for example, one day uh, you are trying to cross a street, 
okay? And a car stopped with engine running. But suddenly you notice the driver is sleeping because it's a fully autonomous vehicle, okay? How many of you would feel comfortable to walk across the street in front of this vehicle with engine running and the driver in sleep? I cannot you know, uh, see how many would feel comfortable uh, because I cannot see all of you at one time uh, in this Zoom meeting. But uh, Stanford University actually did an experiment. Many people would not feel comfortable walking in front of this stopped car with engine running and the driver is in sleep, okay? So this indicates the importance of communications and the interactions between humans and uh, in this case, autonomous vehicles. So to address this issue, for example, it can be solved relatively easily. The autonomous vehicle can just flash the light indicating, I see you, please feel free to walk in front of me or have a sign says, I see you, okay? So this is another example when we move into the mental space, the importance of considering mental space, okay? Uh, the other example is this, okay? So at the construction site, we often see uh, construction workers holding a stop sign. For autonomous vehicles, their smart sensors recently trust. They can all recognize the stop sign and stop. But the interesting thing is now, if you want to crash the traffic in Hong Kong, probably one thing you could do is you just give free t-shirts to 100 students and with big stop sign printed both on the front and the back side of those tissues and send these students to walk around on streets in Hong Kong. And uh, you know, if most of the cars in Hong Kong now, they are autonomous vehicles, many of them probably will be confused, okay? So this brings up another very interesting question that is, what are the key differences between artificial intelligence and the human intelligence, okay? In recent years, GeoAI has become another popular topic. So I would argue that GeoAI needs to go beyond the concept of absolute space and also consider the concepts of relative space, relational space, and mental space to make it closer to human intelligence beyond the current artificial intelligence. Okay, so to summarize uh, these four different types of space, absolute space works with absolute location in space. And we focus on questions such as where are the different objects like the conventional GIs. Relative space works with relative locations to either a fixed object or a moving object, like a vehicle. And uh, we focus on questions such as what are around us? And the relational space works with relations to other objects. And we focus on questions such as what are related to us, like social networks. And the mental space works with the cognitive and the mental aspects of space and we focus on questions such as, what do people have in mind, okay? So that's about the concepts of space under this framework. Next, let's talk about the concepts of place. Yifu Tuan, who is a humanistic geographer and uh, published this famous book, Space and the Place, uh, that is frequently cited. And uh, he indicates that place, is an area in a space that humans have given meaning to it. So place is a social construction that is unique to different people and varies over time. For example, Hong Kong 200 years ago and Hong Kong 100 years ago and Hong Kong today, it's probably perceived as a different kinds of place. 
And also Hong Kong today can be perceived by different people in many different ways, okay? So this uh, the concept of place uh, discussed by Yifu Tuan from a humanistic approach. And the Paul Adams, a Texas Austin, indicates that three meta approaches could be passed as place as location, place as experience, and the place as contested terrain. So you probably can guess what those three meta approaches may be, okay? So for example, for place as location, this is closely related to the traditional spatial analysis approach, which is frequently used in conventional GIs. And the place as experience certainly can be tied to humanistic approach, like what Yifu Tuan uh, talked about place. And the place as contested terrain probably is related to the critical theory approach, okay, or the critical GIs today, okay? And uh, Paul Adams further argues that the essence of place is its ability to synthesize multiple characteristics. In other words, it's not which of these three different approaches is better than the others, okay? It, it, it is important to be able to synthesize these different approaches and consider all of them in order to support different types of research in the social sciences and in the humanities, okay? That's why we propose this new GI science framework. And the Paul Adams further suggested that academic thought constructs every, uh, very precise ways of defining places, but only by grossly simplifying place, either to location in the natural sciences, including conventional GIs, to social categories and hierarchies in the social sciences, or to a type of experience in the humanities. So how can we integrate the concepts of space and the concepts of place? According to John Agni okay, and uh, his collaborators, uh, and Agnew argues that the concept of place includes three pillars. Location refers to location in space, which could be defined by latitudes and longitudes, like what we have been doing in conventional GIs. The second one is locale, refers to the settings for everyday routine social interaction provided in a place. This could be defined by physical, environmental, or social, economic, cultural context, okay? Which is closely related to the concept of relative space. The third one is sense of place, which refers to identification with a place endangered by living uh, in it, okay? This could be defined by human subjective perception or attachment, emotional attachment, to a particular location or locale, okay? So in our framework, we integrate these four different concepts of space and the different concepts of place in this way. So first, absolute space in our space place framework is associated with the concept of location, which suggests a specific location or site that can be conveniently represented by the coordinates based on the concepts of absolute space used in conventional GIs. And uh, the concept of locale is closely related to relative space. In other words, our attention now focuses mainly on the situation, the context, rather than the site, okay? The location of an object. And uh, when we deal with relational space, our focus shifts to place identity. In a relational space, it is based on topological relations rather than absolute locations. So identity among different places or identity among different individuals, like in a social network, becomes more important in a relational network. 
And the mental space is associated with sense of place. In this case, we attempt to reflect what people have in mind about a location, a locale, or a place identity that are associated with absolute space, relative space, or relational space. Okay, so to recap, this uh, space place, human centric space place GI science framework, we have human as dynamic objects and living objects at the center. And then we have the concepts of absolute space, relative space, relational space, mental space integrated with the concepts of location, locale, place, identity, and the sense of place together. And the circle means that they are associated with each other, not independent from each other. So this is a conceptual framework, okay? So the next question probably, probably uh, you have in mind is how can we implement this conceptual framework? So I would like to spend a little bit time to share with you some implementation challenges and the possible solutions. First of all, like conventional GIs, this new GI science framework also will face similar challenges when we deal with issues such as scale, uncertainty, and others. For example, places can be experienced and have different meaning at different scales, okay? When we think of Hong Kong at different scales, okay? We probably will represent it in different ways and perceive it in different ways, okay? But they are still associated with each other at these different scales. So I would argue it may be important to have multiple scale representations that are linked with each other when we try to implement this space place uh, framework. And also we know data use in social sciences and in the humanities often do not have precise locations, boundaries, identities, relationships, et cetera, especially when we move into mental space. So it is critical that we will be able to accommodate these uncertainties beyond the methods we have been using in conventional GIs, okay? In order to develop useful uh, tools for this space place framework. Another question is about the data model for these different concepts of space and place. In my opinion, I do not think a single data model can support all these different concepts of space and place. Just like um, several decades ago, GIS people were arguing between vector data model and rest data model, which one was better. Eventually, we went for both of them for different applications, for different purposes. So for absolute space, we can still use vector rest data models. For relative space, we probably need to integrate the concepts of matrices and arrays with these conventional GIS data models. Relational space, again, matrices and arrays, okay, can play a useful role. For mental space, then we probably need to rely on narratives and the semantic data models. And uh, so in other words, this framework will be able to support different kinds of data models, but still being able to tie them together, okay, to support different types of applications. So that brings up the issue of transformations and the linkages among the different concepts of space and the place. So because they are not independent from each other, so we need to be able to link or associate them together. For example, between absolute space and relative space is probably more straightforward because we can implement transformations between a coordinate system with a fixed origin point in absolute space and a coordinate system with a moving origin point for relative space, okay? So this probably is relatively 
straightforward. And uh, to associate an absolute space with relational space and mental space, we probably can use unique entity IDs, okay, to link them together. So there are different approaches available out there to consider, okay, when we try to implement this. And also there are some relevant technologies and tools which can be useful for implementation of this conceptual framework, such as story maps, deep mapping that have become popular in recent years. And uh, they go beyond conventional maps and use other ways for communication, such as videos, photos, sounds, narratives, etc. And uh, this also probably explains why S3, okay, the GIS community has been using story maps increasingly. Okay. And uh, effective computing, which can help us recognize, interpret, process, and uh, simulate human effects. Okay. Also could be a potential technology for this framework. And a few days ago, I listened to this presentation by Alex Sandy Pentland, who is director of Human Dynamics Group at MIT Media Lake. He bought this book, his signals written by himself. And uh, they have been using data collected from human interactions, including uh, facial expression, body language, and uh, 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 speech to try to estimate, to predict human behaviors. And uh, they, they argue that they were able to achieve 80 to 90% accuracy at behavioral prediction for speed dating, hiring, salary negotiation, and other kinds of human behavior. That's quite impressive. And this could be very useful to, uh, for the mental space part, okay? So this is the webpage of the Human uh, Dynamics Group at MIT Media Lab. And uh, they indicate that they use tools of computational social science to ask how we can better organize society, government, and uh, companies. So I hope GI science down the road also can help organize, better organize our societies, governments, and companies, okay? So finally, some concluding remarks. So we have some time for discussions. I believe this human-centric space place GI science framework is more intuitive and natural to human thinking. So this framework then is likely to bring GIS and the GIS science closer to naive geography, which can serve as the basis for the design of the so-called intelligent GIS that will act and respond, at least closer to what a person would. And also, I believe this framework could help us make GIS and GIS science more relevant and useful to human geographers in geography, as well as researchers in the humanities and social sciences, okay? Finally, I believe this framework will take more than one person's efforts to improve and uh, implement it. So I look forward to more people joining this effort. And uh, thank you very much uh, for your patience and uh, participation. I will welcome any questions, comments, and suggestions. Thank you. Back to you, Professor Huang. Uh, thank you, Professor Xiao, for the very thought-provoking and uh, stimulating uh, talk. And you raised many important issues underlying the interactions between the four types of uh, space, uh, which are very enlightening. Okay. Uh, now the, the floor is open. Actually, we have got uh, some questions in the chat window. So the first question is from Dr. Xiao Huang at the University of Arkansas. 
and he said it's a very informative pre uh, presentation. I would argue that one of the issues for time geography on the basis of detailed human trajectory is the uh, privacy uh, concern. How do you see the challenge of gauging human dynamics in fine-grained manner while respecting individuals' privacy? Yeah, that's the first question. Ex yeah, excellent question. Uh, privacy concern will be always an important consideration. If we use GPS uh, to check individuals at a very high resolution, spatial and temporal resolution, there's no way to completely avoid uh, confidentiality and privacy issues, okay? So that is why we probably also need to consider other concepts of space and place, such as why Google and Apple decided to develop this contact tracing based on Bluetooth instead of GPS, okay? Uh, to minimize, okay, or reduce the privacy concerns, okay? Uh, so, uh, and also another important thing we need to keep in mind, just like the autonomous vehicle example I shared with uh, you, of you. Uh, so do we need a global GIS database at five to 10 centimeter positional accuracy in order to support autonomous vehicle operation? Probably not. If we can combine the concepts of space, okay, between absolute space and other concepts of space, okay. So I think there are, there are ways to maybe not completely remove the pri privacy issues, but at least to reduce uh, the privacy concerns, okay, by expanding. Uh, GI science beyond the concept of absolute space. So I hope that answered this question. Yeah, thank you. So uh, another question from Huan Chong Yuan. I'm curious about the processes of generating this framework. How do we know this is comprehensive enough to answer the human dynamic questions in geography? Can you elaborate more on the process? This is another very good question. Uh, no, I cannot say for sure. <laughs> this framework is comprehensive enough, okay? Uh, because we always run, this is an evolving field and we always run into new challenges and the new questions. But in order to move conventional GIs beyond the concept of absolute, absolute space, in my view, really limits main, uh, us from you know, uh, using GIS to support many different uh, studies in social sciences and uh, in the humanities. Uh, I think this framework, I hope, at least gives us a broader scope and a better chance, okay, to better serve the needs of researchers beyond the GI, conventional GIS community. Yeah, and I think that is also why often we have been criticized, uh, you know, when we try to uh, convince our colleagues, even in geography, when we talk to many human geographers, uh, they are still not convinced the conventional GIS approach is capable of addressing their research needs. So uh, yes, you are right. This framework may not be comprehensive to address every possible human dynamics uh, question or challenge, but I hope at least it gives more possibilities. Yeah, thank you. And uh, another question is, uh, is there any possibility to integrate the four kinds of space place based on time geography to visualize and analyze people's daily life in GIS? Uh, good, good question. 
So I've been working on Tang Jiafi for quite a while, okay, uh, for uh, more than two decades. And uh, one thing I think we need to do is uh, when Hexstream developed Tang Jiafi, it was in the 50s, 1950s, and 1960s. Technologies were very different from what we have today. So for example, the conventional of the concepts in the in Tang Jiafi, they do not consider virtual space much, even though Hextrain in some articles did mention like telecommunications. But like space-time pace, okay? If it's simply based on XY coordinates in physical space based on the concept of absolute space, then it's limited. So I think in order to make time GRP more useful, one thing I've been working on is to really extend the concepts in time GRP for the hybrid physical virtual world. So in other words, for example, another con uh, one, one important concept in time GRP is space-time prison, okay? And uh, in conventional GIS, we can do all kinds of mathematical computations to uh, handle space-time prison. But what is space-time prison in virtual space? It is totally different from the concept of space-time prison in physical space. Because now we use ICT instead of transportation to move between different places, okay? In physical space versus in virtual space. So, uh, you know, if we want to continue to use time geography to handle these different kinds of human dynamics, I think we need to extend the concepts in classical time geography for the hybrid physical virtual world first. That's another topic I've been working on. I hope uh, that answers this question. Okay. The uh, next question is to be asked by Dr. Bo Jiang from the Department of Sociology. So, okay, uh, so yeah, did please. I, did I miss some questions? Uh, yeah, we will ask directly, Dr. Jiang Bo. Oh, okay, okay, please go ahead. Yeah, good evening, uh, Professor Xiao. Thank you so much for your top provoking talk. I have been um, interested, I'm a criminologist, and I have been interested in the spatial temporal patterns of crime and deviant behaviors. And one of my recent research examines the spatial and temporal stability of hotspots and harm spots of non-state terrorism using the global terrorism database developed at the University of Maryland. One mm -hmm. of my main findings is that the hotspots and harm spot grids that was spat spatially uh, stable over time tends to concentrate around the borders where people speak a different language, religion, or practice different cultures rather than concentrating around official country borders where one may reason reasonably expect. So this pattern seems to have a high degree of overlap with the landscape map developed at the University of Maryland. And I have been trying to find a theoretical framework to, concept to conceptualize my study. After listening to your very inspiring talk today, I think the notion of mental space fits pretty well with my uh, with my study, so what I wanted to say is that uh, thank you so much for providing this opportunity, and I will study deeper into your mental space framework and try to incorporate it uh, to analyze my results. Thank you so much. Thank you, thank you for your comments. And uh, Cindy, yeah, uh, you know, mental space always will play a role in many human behaviors and uh, activities. And also for terrorism, okay? For terrorism, for example, uh, I think relational space also could be important. Yeah, how they are related to each other and influence each other. Yeah, so, uh, you know, I, 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 hope, I hope this framework can help uh, your research. <laughs> Certainly, thank you so much again. Yeah, sure. Yeah, thank you. The next question is from uh, a PhD student in the Department of Geography. 
uh, Lord Li. And she asked uh, in your four kinds of space to depict our world, how human dynamics you proposed is connected to our traditional terms such as spatial temporal dynamics. Okay, uh, I would interpret it this way. Uh, when we say spatial temporal dynamics, actually, I don't quite uh, understand what you mean by traditional terms, okay? Because uh, in my opinion, spatial temporal dynamics can be associated with any of those different concepts of space and uh, place. So for example, uh, relational space also can have different spatial patterns and, and does they change over time. So we, we can also have spatial temporal dynamics for relational space. That's also true, I think, for uh, mental space and other types of space and the place. Okay? So I'm not quite sure if I understood your question correctly. If not, please follow up. So, Lord Suli, do you want to add some? Uh, yes, uh, th thanks, Professor. Um, my question actually is about, because in our traditional GIS field, when we analyze is to say uh, how we analyze the spatial and temporal dynamics, which is also uh, in the time in geography that we are interested about the spatial and temporal dynamics. And in contrast to your proposed um, uh, human dynamics, I wonder whether there are some connections that uh, whether such as the human dynamics is already including the spatial and temporal dynamics or there are some connections between these three terms. And thank okay. you. I didn't thank know thank you. Thank you for the, thank you for the explanation. Uh, yeah. Sorry, I didn't fully understand your question correctly. So uh, first of all, the reason I use the term human dynamics, and uh, in many papers, they use uh, human mobility. The reason I prefer human dynamics uh, than human mobility in this context is because dynamics, this word by itself, implies changes over time. So time is part of it, okay? And uh, also human dynamics, I hope it covers a broader scope than human mobility, okay? Because when we talk about human mobility, we, uh, most of us will think about movements, okay? But human dynamics really covers a lot of things, including the mental space part, okay? So, and uh, then in terms of the spatial temporal, uh, patterns, uh, conventional GIs, okay? Uh, like Professor Jiang uh, just mentioned, you know, for example, we create these hotspots, okay? Heat maps, okay? We pretty much focus on locations in physical space, in absolute space only, okay? But we probably did not really consider the spatial temporal dynamics in relational space. For example, how we are associated with each other in, for example, your Facebook uh, friends network, because they can also influence your behavior. For example, where, uh, which restaurant you would go to, where you are going to shop, et cetera. All of these like Google, Amazon, they keep pushing these uh, you know, messages to us because they try to influence our behaviors based on the big data they have been collecting, okay? So then this gets into the spatial temporal dynamics in mental space because they, they try to understand our mental space in order to push the correct messages, okay? The uh, useful or, or uh, the messages that will really change our behavior, okay? And that they can make more profits, okay? So uh, that's what I mean 
in terms of the spatial temporal dynamics for these different types of space and places under this framework, which goes beyond the conventional GIS spatial temporal dynamics. Uh, did I answer your question? Yeah, 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 very sure. Thanks for your explanation. It, it actually in, inspires me much. Can, may I have one very quick following question? Do you mean that the spatial and temporal dynamics, what we exploring under the mental space or relational space is quite different or make some contributions to our um, like uh, previous understanding under the uh, conventional space? So that your framework could make a lot of more insightful uh, reading uh, findings under like the spatial and temporal dynamics on the different concept. Yes, if you ask me, my answer is yes. But oh, some yeah. of my colleagues in GIS science, I don't know if <laughs> they would all agree with me. <laughs> okay. Oh yeah, but thanks. What thanks. I'm hoping is down the road when we teach GIS and GIS science, we will not just teach the concepts of absolute space. We will not just teach the concepts of Euclidean geometry, Cartesian coordinate system, okay? If we want to integrate humans into GI science, yeah. So, uh, yeah, I hope, I hope, uh, you know, we will approach GI science somewhat differently. And hopefully that will also make it more useful to our colleagues in other social sciences, okay, even in the humanities. Yeah, yeah, thanks, Professor. Okay. Thank you. Then, uh, Liang Hai, so do you want to ask directly? Professor Liang Hai. Hey, hey, hello, 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 hello Professor hi, hi. Uh, I'm Liang Hai, I'm, I'm an assistant professor from uh, the School of Journalism and Communication. So uh, first, uh, thank you very much for the uh, very informative and uh, systematic introduction. So um, the system is uh, is beautiful for me. Okay. <laughs> so, so uh, but you just mentioned, but you emphasize a lot uh, on space and place in the following talks. But I just want to know more about how you interpret and incorporate the time dimension in your in your in your system. Have you considered that time maybe sometimes in uh, in social science, we already we can also consider it as a relative concept. So for someone that may consider that time is long, um, short, and whatever. So certainly there are some uh, variances as well. So and also sometimes maybe it could be coordinated and in, in and with other uh, aspects or dimension of a space that you just mentioned, like the relational and the mental dimensions. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you very much for this excellent question. When I was preparing this presentation, I debated myself. Uh, you know, I was, I was thinking about spending more time on time, but then I realized I would not be able to finish my presentation in one hour. So for the second part of my presentation, I left the time dimension out, okay? Uh, that's mainly because of the time constraint. So time is also not as straightforward as we often think what it is, okay? So for example, uh, the time geography, the uh, slides I showed in my presentation, we simply treat time as a timeline, okay? Vertical dimension. But if you talk to historians in the humanities, okay? Or you talk to planners, Okay, they often needs to come up with different scenarios. Okay, so history could have developed in different ways. Okay, so we in this case we could also have branch times. Okay, in other words, okay, we could have different scenarios. Okay, for historian, uh, for historians and for planners, and also a lot of the human dynamics, for example, traffic patterns, okay? And uh, many other human dynamic patterns, they have this cyclic time pattern, okay? So uh, in other words, okay, when we really bring time into consideration, it should not be just a linear time as a straight timeline, okay? Uh, 
in order to accommodate the different uh, needs of considering time, okay? And again, time itself. For example, I remember uh, this was probably uh, more than 10 years ago at one of the uh, GI science conferences. And after the keynote uh, presentation by a, a leading scholar talking about time, and that the audience started to debate whether time exists. Does time exist in real world? Okay, so you know uh, we got into very interesting debates. Eventually, I raised my hand and uh, I said, "You know, it really doesn't matter if time exists or not. We need time as a reference framework." in order to measure changes and uh, represent processes, okay? So the reason that we have hours, days, years, they are all artificial, but we need it as a reference framework for, to help us study the different phenomena in the real world, okay? So time could be uh, framed differently, okay? Uh, for different kinds of studies. So this is a very good question and uh, which probably can take another hour to discuss it. But uh, thank you very much for bringing it up. And uh, uh, I fully agree with you. In the second part of my presentation, I did not really get into time much. Thank you, thank you, thank you very much. It's very, very but interesting. <laughs> okay. Uh, thank you. Then next question from David. I'm in, uh, very interested about the incorporation of mental space. How could it be investigated and analyzed in combination with objective spatial data? I think college and other behavior geographers methods are quite different from the GIS. Okay, very good question. So, uh, I'm not, read, I'm not reading the questions in the chat box. I, I will answer just based on what Professor Huang uh, briefed about the question. So just like the example I showed in my presentation. So if you Google Chinatown in New York City using Google Maps, using OpenStreetMaps, conventional GIS approach, tends to give you a boundary. Who defines that boundary? Okay. And in this case, it's Google. Those people behind Google Maps. And uh, who created the boundary of Chinatown in New York City in OpenStreetMap? Whoever volunteered or the group of people who interacted and came up with that solution. But we know that boundary keeps changing. Because, for example, uh, during the pandemic, uh, many stores may have been closed, okay? So the boundary of Chinatown might have changed. And uh, even we send different people to Chinatown today, they probably would perceive the boundary of Chinatown differently. So I think uh, the real challenge is really not we try to uh, make this subjective data, okay, fully embedded into the objective data in conventional GIS. Instead, for example, for boundaries, we should try to show based on a group of people, how many of them would perceive a certain location as part of Chinatown or not as part of Chinatown. In other words, you know, uh, the concepts will be like the fuzzy boundary, okay? Uh, so in this case, okay, the so-called objective representation in conventional GIS at least can a little bit better reflect these different subjective perceptions, okay, in mental space. So I would argue that's also why I argue that one single data model 
probably is not sufficient to support this framework. We may need different data models to support these different uh, concepts, okay? But we need to be able to link them together. So for example, even we have a crisp boundary for Chinatown in New York City, but once I click it, it will show me all these different perceived boundaries by different population groups, okay? By different people. So then I get a better understanding that boundary is not a well-defined boundary, okay? And how different people could have perceived that boundary line differently. So that's what I'm hoping the future GIS can provide this kind of flexibility. Yeah, thank you. Did I answer the question? Very much so. Uh, yeah, yeah, thank you, uh, Professor Shaw. Um, uh, I'm, I'm a, because I'm a human geographer, so um, maybe um, I, uh, I perceive it uh, very uh, difficult uh, technique for you to combine the subjective data and the objective data, because sometimes people perceive the space quite differently from what you mentioned, like uh, boundaries or uh, maps, because like uh, uh, Kevin and um, uh, have done some uh, like mental maps uh, 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 investigation, people may only and draw some uh, uh, key uh, uh, points or some key uh, roads in their mind. Uh, and the um, coordinates may be quite different from the, the real uh, uh, spatial maps. So uh, I quite agree with you that uh, we may need quite different or uh, uh, multiple uh, methods or uh, models to, to combine these two different uh, types of data. And uh, I think sometimes uh, uh, maybe uh, we, we should uh, um, break the, the, the existing um, objective uh, uh, framework to, to, to go beyond it uh, or, or to incorporate the, the, the subjective data. Yeah, thank you. Yeah. I fully agree with you. So under this framework, I would not combine subjective data with objective data. Instead, my, my approach is to associate, link them together rather than to combine them. Yeah. So in this case, we can keep the characteristics of these different approaches. Okay. Uh, thank you. Uh, next question is also related to uh, time, but the person who asked question is not uh, here. He has uh, left the meeting. He said, the moment you introduce the dimension of time into GIS, you're actually creating narratives with time-space models. And I think this is an interesting way of thinking about how analysis of mental space can be integrated into this model. Yeah, that's his uh, comment. <laughs> okay, thank you. Thank you for the comments. Yes, uh, you know, narratives also could be one way to handle the mental space part. And it can certainly be linked to other concepts of space in GIS. Okay, perfect. Then, uh, Tony. Hello, Tony. Are you there? Okay, uh, so I can read his uh, comment or question. I'd like to hear your thoughts on how the distinction of four types of space may be compared to a related effort by researchers on social networks. Yes, my, my question is actually an invitation for you to to uh, comment on the possibility for the cross-fertilization between your framework, very powerful framework, and what social network researchers have done for the past half century, namely 
extending the concept of physical space to social space. Once, once we do that in sociology, we find it necessary and very useful to distinguish different types of network space. That is in social space, it doesn't make sense to just think of it as a single grid coordinate system. Each type of social network, there are many types of social networks, and they are interlocking each other with each other in a dynamic way. So it's always useful for that for us to distinguish different networks as different layers of a space. And then we can do descriptive analysis of each network, as well as descriptive and causal modeling of different types. Uh, relationships across networks. So I'm wondering, that kind of effort have any resemblance to what you're doing with extending classical space, absolute space into four types of space? Thanks. Yes, thank you very much for this uh, comment and the suggestion. Sandy, you know, I look forward to uh, possible collaboration with sociologists, okay, especially on the social network side. I fully agree with you. When we talk about social space, it's a generic term, okay? And it can be represented and come in many different forms, okay? So we could have social networks in physical space. We could have social ne networks in virtual space. And also, even we have a relational space for Friends network, for example, for social network, a relational space for social network. But you know, different people in this social network could perceive each other very differently. Then that gets into the mental space part. Yeah. So even though we have the same topological relationships, but from each individual uh, node in that topological network, they could perceive other nodes in their social network differently. Yeah, and also it's certainly true. For example, I could have a social network at work. I could have a social network of my private life. I could have a social network in my professional uh, community and so on and so forth. So these different social networks, they can be, uh, they can have different structures and uh, they, but they, they could also interact with each other in many different ways. So uh, that also gets into the complex system <laughs> side. But uh, yes, uh, also one thing I've been working with some colleagues in the humanities and uh, in, in social sciences, one thing I've learned is I need to learn a lot from my colleagues in other fields. Because for example, when I work with historians, I have learned that they really think and they uh, think differently and that they use different approaches. And uh, they even, uh, you know, talk about the same problem very differently. <laughs> yeah. So I think that's why, uh, that's also part of the reason I think GI science really needs to go beyond what it has been in the last several decades. Mm -hmm. Yeah, because uh, otherwise uh, it will be hard for GI science researchers to communicate with our colleagues in other fields. Yeah, so I hope I can learn more from sociologists. I look forward to learning more too. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, thank you. The next uh, question from Fan Zhuang Yue. I think in Alex Petland's most works, uh, still physical space is deemed more important than virtual space in forming human relationships. I wonder, among the spaces in the framework you presented, are there certain weights towards any one of these space, uh, towards the space? Uh, at least in terms of the presentation by Alex Pentland a few days ago, uh, that uh, honest signals, I don't think it's based on 
uh, physical space, okay? Uh, it's more trying to understand what people might be thinking based on their body languages, okay? Their interaction manners, facial expressions, etc. So my impression, at least from that presentation and that particular piece of work, uh, a lot of it is tied to more the mental space side and also the relational space. It, it's also trying to, for example, understand, okay, in a group of people, who are the leaders, who are the major connectors in a social network, okay? Uh, in physical space, yes, you know, they observe all of this in physical space, yes, yeah, if that's what you mean. They observe these interactions in physical space, okay? They, uh, but they, that group also did some uh, research based on the uh, virtual space, uh, social networks, yeah. Mm -hmm. But for that particular one, yes, uh, it was based on the observations of the human interactions in physical space. I hope okay. I answered your question and understood your question correctly. Okay. Then, uh, Jian Fa, could you ask uh, directly? Uh, okay. Uh, hello, Professor Xu. Thank you, thank you for your very impressive presentation. So under the Smart City Initiative, many systems have been developed which may be based on GIS and locational information to some extent. So in the future, can these different systems be integrated as much more uh, integrated and also all means that they can talk into each other or share information or more automatically between them? Thank you. It's good to see you again, Professor Sen. Uh, we, we served on the same academic review team this past summer. And uh, uh, excellent question. Yes. Uh, for example, if I could use the example of Google I use in my presentation. So certainly we can represent Google by the XY coordinates of its headquarters in California. But also we could represent Google using its URL in different countries or its IP addresses, or simply the name of Google. And these are not contradictory to each other. We could use these multiple representations of this entity Google. Which one we are going to use depends on our particular application needs. And also some of our needs may need to access the representation of Google in multiple ways. For example, for servers, okay, the IP address. The IP address can be just an abstract number or a IP address is associated with a physical server computer, which has a physical location. Yeah, so my argument here is for a lot of these down the road, uh, we should not, for example, one major limitation of the GIS we have today, in my opinion, is we have to start everything with locations. Without locations, we cannot even build a GIS database. That should not be the case. For sociologists, sometimes, or for historians, sometimes they don't really need that precise XY coordinates for their research. So we should be able to represent for example, Google in many different ways. And uh, which particular representation will be the most useful to particular research, then we should let the users to choose it. Yeah, I hope that answered your question, Professor yeah, thank Sen. You. Thank you. So uh, Professor Shaw, we still have a few more questions. So could you entertain them? Yes, sure. Yeah, okay. it's fine. Uh, then next from Professor Xinyue Ye uh, at uh, TAMU. They asked uh, how human dynamics research would consider the increasing trend of human computer partnership. Hi, Xinyue. 
uh, hey, Xin Yi and I, oh, we have been working together on human dynamics for uh, some time. Uh, you know, in terms of human computer partnership, I think that's uh, why I mentioned what are the major differences between artificial intelligence and the human intelligence? Also, the examples of autonomous vehicles like uh, crossing the street in front of a stopped car with engine running, but you know, uh, driver is in sleep, or the stop sign example. So, you know, in terms of the human computer partnership, I think from the GI side, okay we need to think uh, how we can incorporate humans better, okay? And that's also what I hope the computer uh, side can also uh, treat humans more like humans, okay? So, you know, including the geo AI, okay? So I hope, you know, it's not just uh, uh, using the so-called artificial intelligence methods to analyze X, Y coordinates, okay, in absolute space. Uh, even though we can predict, you know, certain phenomena, but I think uh, it will be limited in terms of supporting other types of research. Yeah. Uh, Dr. Uh, Shao, I think- uh, Can I answer your question? Uh, I think, yeah, I, I think I actually, uh, there's one thing left unanswered is when we talk about the human dynamics, we believe it's a human, but now because of the increasing trend of human computer partnership, sometimes you really don't know for example behind the computer, if I do not show up, you, you don't know who I am. So the, even you don't know it's a human being or machine. So especially human computer has a more closer interaction. Uh, so, it, so it will, another interesting thing will come is before we think a human have similar nature across the places, we have some similar needs. But in certain uh, cities or regions, we have more advanced integration between human and computer. Then you will see big difference across space and across social economic groups. Good. Xinyue, okay, now I understand your question better. I also see in the chat window, uh, you also ask how to deal with data sparsity issue in human dynamics research. I think this could be linked together, the human computer partnership and the data sparsity issue in human dynamics research. So what I'm hoping is this framework will lead to people, humans, contribute data, just like Facebook, Google. We all contribute data to Facebook, to Google. So if we make GIS closer to how people think and use, my thinking is we should rely on us as researchers to collect every piece of data. We will still do this kind of you know, data collection, okay, to answer particular questions. But in the meantime, to address the data sparsity issue in human dynamics research, if we can make GI science closer to human thinking, closer to human behaviors, then we will have a better chance to have people contribute their data. For example, this becomes an egg on their smartphones or future smart devices. And uh, it will automate like subjective, the mental space part, okay? Even we conduct surveys, we conduct interviews, we can only collect limited amount of data. But now, you know, in fact, many of these apps, they are collecting similar kinds of data, okay? In large quantity, okay? So that's what I'm hoping this framework can lead us to to address the human computer partnership and uh, the, hum the data sparsity issue in human dynamics research, you rest. Thank you. Thank okay. you, Xinyue. Then we still have a few more. 
So next question is about the hybrid physical virtual space. Uh, the development of ICTs seems to loosen the constraint of space and time on human physical activities. Do you think in what ways the virtual space interacts with the physical space? And will the expansion of virtual space cause the decline of physical space? Okay, uh, another very good question. So back in the 1990s, I remember I was invited to participate in several uh, international uh, small group kind of uh, uh, meetings, okay? Uh, funded by the US NSF and the European Science Foundation to talk about specifically uh, this issue, okay? So uh, also for some time in those early days, some people argue, for example, telecommuting is going to solve traffic congestion problem. It never happened, okay? And traffic congestion is still severe today. And uh, uh, Helen Kankulis at UC Santa Barbara has published several articles which are very informative about this. I would uh, recommend uh, readings, okay, of those articles. And in this case, okay, so, uh, for example, now, when I go to a city that I'm not familiar with, I just open my Google Maps, look at all those restaurants and see which ones has the high best rating and the recommended by a large number of people. So in other words, my choice of a restaurant in physical space is heavily influenced by these interactions in virtual space, okay? There are numerous examples of this kind of inferences between our human behaviors in physical space and the human behaviors in virtual space. So the challenge is really what exactly these interactions and the inferences are. There have been a lot of research on this, okay? And, uh, uh, so I don't think, I don't think, okay. For example, Helen Kukulis, uh, in suggested that uh, the interactions between physical activities and virtual activities is not just substitution. It's not just uh, the virtual activities can substitute uh, physical activities. Like now uh, we don't need to uh, go to a library, okay? We can access most of these articles online and the books online, okay? That could be an example of substitution. But there are other kinds of activities. For example, you order uh, uh, items from Amazon, okay? Even though the first part is virtual, but Amazon still need to package those items, put them into a package and uh, ship them through aircrafts, trucks, eventually to your location. So it does not completely replace physical activities in uh, the physical space. Instead, it changes the way these activities taking place in physical space, okay? So there are different kinds of interactions between activities in physical space and the virtual space. So uh, we need to consider all these different types of interactions when we talk about hybrid physical virtual world. I hope I answered your question, Fu Zhen. Okay, uh, thank you very much. Uh, perhaps uh, the last question. Uh, which is about uh, the scale of human dynamics. So can the four types of space are uh, associated with the different scales of human dynamics? Okay, I'm trying to read the question on, okay. uh, in the chat window. Yeah, yes. Yes, yeah, so that's what I mentioned briefly. Uh, when I talk about uh, some implementation challenges, okay, and the possible solutions. And the scale issue were always there. 
will be always there, just like you know many geographic uh, problems. So you know, for example, in absolute space, we need maps of different scales. In relative space, okay. So are we concerned about the surrounding uh, environment? Uh, you know, uh, ten meters around us or 100 meters around us, or one kilometer around us, okay? These are all scale issues. Also in mental space, when I look at Hong Kong, at one scale will give me a very different perception from looking at Hong Kong at a different scale, okay? So, uh, so uh, it's not unique to this conceptual framework uh, I just discussed. I think the scale uh, issues will be associated with all of these geographic and other kinds of uh, research. Okay, so I hope that answers your question. I will take the time to thank everyone yeah, for your participation for this long meeting. Uh, you yeah, are welcome. Yeah, thank you very much for the excellent uh, presentation. Okay, yeah. Professor, uh, thank you very much for the insightful uh, talk. Also, the active participation from the uh, audience. Yeah, thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you all. Thank, thank you. you. Thank you.